scratch darn, no, probably darn well. <laughs> Does this light bother the camera? News edition 97004. There was once a man who received important phone calls at his home, only to eventually discover that he didn't live there. There was once a man who received important phone calls at his home, only to eventually discover that they weren't for him. There was once a man who received important phone calls at his home only to eventually discover that he was making them. Yeah. Take your choice. <laughs> One way to judge the relative significance of discoveries is by how funny they strike you. <laughs> Scenery. When the sun, where the sun does, where the sun does not shine is where things look best. By sun, I think it means the mind. One man had a twin brother he never knew about because at birth he had swallowed him. One man had a twin brother he never knew about because at birth the brother had swallowed him. Take your choice. Either way, it works out the same. How to tell that you're deluded, asleep, and in the dark? You're busy. One man had this thing he continually dickered with. Then he began to wonder if it was an operation rather than a thing. And after that began to suspect that it might be a space rather than an operation. To struggle with an illusion is to be overcome by it. A man had a monkey that learned to talk. At first it only talked to itself, which the man found amusing. But then the man began to pay closer attention to what the monkey was saying. And the situation soon turned into the man believing that the monkey was speaking specifically to him. And if you think that's weird... It got even worse. I'll leave it to you to figure out in what way. One man had a sickness which for years he struggled to cure. One man had a sickness which for years he struggled to ignore. One man had a sickness which for years he struggled to absorb. Take your choice. One man's personal motto is relentless rigidity, steadfast stupidity. <laughs> I believe this one, too, has something to do with the mind. <laughs> to live with a dream is to forever sleep. When first witnessing a, shake, a snake shed its skin, a man thought, ah, a creature and its enlightenment. Mm -hmm. To try and add some fresh pizzazz to the process, one man moved and didn't give life his new address. From someplace deep, deep inside, a mind cried out, Help! I'm lost in here. In response to which the man muttered, Ah, but were that not true? Then just think what I might do. One man was captured by an enemy. One man captured an enemy. One man became his own enemy and captured himself. Take your choice. To dance with a ghost is to be forever led. There was once a man who wanted to lose weight 
And the approach he took was to never look at his fat. I ask you, what kind of approach is that? <laughs> One man dozed and dreamed he was a bat. It has been said that a good son doesn't spend his father's money. And there are two good reasons for this. One is that the money is not his. And the other is that even if it were, it's no longer any good. Got it? Good. One man thought everyone else looked foolish. One man thought he looked foolish. One man thought foolishness was the fashion of the day. Take your choice. When one man heard it said that, if three men tell the same lie, it becomes true. He was struck. Never mind the three men part. Just look at your own thoughts. There was once a comedian who lost his job when he lost his ability to speak. He has since come under suspicion regarding the blinding of several people. The matter of health and the several potentials, possibilities. Being well will get you to hell. Getting to heaven requires something more. And now from poetry to some hard medical news. You were born as well and developed as you will ever be naturally. See, that's why being normal doesn't count for anything. At least around here. If you know what I mean. The more that people talk and ponder, the more out of control they spin. The less that people talk and ponder, the more out of control they remain. It's all in the knowing. And then it's all in the doing. And then it's again all in the knowing. One man ate an airplane. And just in time, he says, for it was about to eat him. One man's awakening revealed to him this important fact, that when it rained, he got wet. That is, if he stayed out in it. Yeah. One man discovered that his mind was a source of all precipitation. And not only that, but also of all his coming, of all his going in and out of doors. To debate a reflection is to be, for sure, out-argued. To help clarify his pint, I mean point, of the divers and indirect ways in which the gods work, the priest, during the royal religious service, told the following story. During the routine monthly checkup and advisory, a sexual broker said to his client, those who work the bushes must also trim the limbs, which caused the client to say to himself, is he trying to give me some coded advice regarding a highly secretive investment opportunity, or is he coming on to me? There the priest stopped his comments for the moment and smiled confidently as he slowly turned and surveyed the faces in the room. Obviously conveying the message of, I assume I've made my point. And suddenly the king interrupted. What happened to your pint? <laughs> divers is as divers does. And indirects how it always was. I mean is, but it didn't rhyme. Yeah. As he sat on the edge of the bed later that night, his royal priestlessness, priestliness, <laughs> With head in hand, softly groaned and confided to his wife, I mean girlfriend, that sometimes he wished he'd gone into blacksmithing after all. Yes, yes, to help clarify his point. Don't we all? Us friggin' all. 
The mind is like a constant hypnotic whirlpool, always calling, come here, come here. But hey, just a minute. Who was it that stirred up these waters in the first place? But hey, wait a second. Where did these waters come from to begin with? But whoa, put it all on hold. What's the problem here? Isn't what we're getting all worked up about simply the nature of whirlpools? Come here, come here it calls. Hey, you come here. It's the same thing. What? No choice this time? Here is the answer to my persistent question. A man cannot tell you what he is going to say next because he does not know what he is going to think next. And he does not know what he is going to think next for the very simple reason that he is not the one doing his thinking. One man believed that if he was never home, it would never catch on fire. One man awoke from a dream and wished his house would go up in flames. A clever mind becomes deceptively clever. The victim of the deception being the one in whom such a mind dwells. There's only one thing you can't be too much of for your own good. And that's the great nothingness. The extremely hard to come by knowledge of the great nothingness. Devoid of all cleverness. What better way to overcome an unbeatable foe than to discover how easily he is pacified? What better way to handle an irrepressible distraction than to discover how easily it itself can be distracted and detained? <laughs> to try and correct an echo is to, well, I'm sure by now you get the point of all that. To pursue the mind with the mind is to chase a cheetah astride a blind tortoise. In times of confusion and uncertainty, one man would often be comforted at home by way of the electronic message that viewers like him were made possible in part by public television. <laughs> he says that any question regarding the lack of so-called logic to this becomes insignificant when weighed against any improvement in one's emotional condition. And while I thought that was the end of his comments, he quickly added that it was about time the rest of us woke up to the fact and quit spinning our wheels, all fuming and worked up over what makes sense and what doesn't. He says that as modern men and women, with all the constant stresses of contemporary civilization, we could do with a lot less logic in the cause of, account, in the cause of acquiring much more peace and peace of mind, peace of fucking mind, where we don't care anymore whether some particular something or other makes sense, as long as it makes us feel fucking better, <laughs> end quote. I waited a few seconds to see if indeed he was finished speaking this time. And with no more words coming from his lips <clears throat> and the smoke gradually decreasing from his ears, it seemed so, so I left. Wrestling with illusions creates chaos and pins one securely in place. Why treat what's yours as imposed? And why treat what's imposed as yours? And why see the irrelevant as adversarial? A knowing man's only victory is in his abandoning the meaningless battlefield. Where on goes on the endless conflict resulting in neither ultimate triumph nor conclusive defeat. Just the endless, meaningless, unresolvable conflict, which is at root illusionary, as in unproductive. 
A man learned how to capture wild geese, but after he had captured one using a certain method, none others would fall for it. So he was continually inventing new ways to affect their capture, and they, just as persistently, would quickly adjust their behavior so as to escape from each new trap soon after it appeared. Who should be given credit for the superior smarts? <clears throat> the man, for his ability to come up with an endless number of new snares, or the geese, for their boundless talent to recognize and avoid them? Or is the pursuit of such questions as this the ultimate snare? of oneself. One man found himself in a fog. He tried to get out of the fog. Then he tried blowing the fog away. Mm -hmm. Then he tried to swallow the fog. <coughs> and finally just learned to live with it. The fog never saw him as having a choice anyway. Yeah. All reactions to other people is slavery. Slavery, blindness, and ultimately death. All reactions are of the mind. In one mystical school, the first year they teach students to look at what they're already thinking metaphorically. In the second year they teach them to quit looking at what they're thinking. In the third year, they teach, they teach them to quit thinking metaphorically. And in their final year, they're told, to re, they're told to relate to what they think in the way they did before coming to school. <laughs> One man started his own school and adopted as its fight song, Oh, the dropout rate, the dropout rate, yay, right! Talking to other creature, talking to others creates divisions, distractions, and confusion. While talking to yourself in a certain specialized manner can achieve just the opposite. While it is taken as common knowledge that nothing can be in two places at the same time, the reality of this discovery internally is the discovery and anything but common. One man looked to the east, one man looked to the west, one man looked to the north, one man looked to the south. Take your choice, but if you do, expect blindness. In one jurisdiction, the greatest comment a man can make is, no comment. And yet, this may not be the ultimate realm, nor the final word. I thought I might point out an unrealized and unnoticed similarity between a certain aspect going on in what would be considered quite hard-nosed areas of science and that area normally referred to as the mystical. One of the, according to all present reports, so here we are in 1997, it's been going on for a few years, but in the Western world uh, there's a common report that the next great scientific breakthrough, medically and by some people's view, even beyond just the medical area, is the field of the question of human consciousness. That uh, people make writers, some scientists are now making fairly passionate, are writing fairly passionate essays and insisting that uh, even cosmologically, 
going out externally in another direction that man may have reached a point of diminishing returns in his potential discoveries, or even if he hasn't, he has made a grave error and not looking right at home to human consciousness. People have said this 5,000 years ago, but here we are in what is considered to be a more advanced intellectual era than 5,000 years prior. But also, they are already admitting, and I'm talking now hard scientists, I'm talking about neurologists, psychiatrists, but it seems to be mainly in the field of neurology. They're pointing out, and already started their own form of debates, that is contemporary debates over it, of the problems facing or the challenges facing pinning down what human consciousness is. And they currently have a five or six well-publicized pieces of machinery that are down to the level now that they're threatening. Uh, we'll be able to, in essence, photograph genetic activity in the brain. And so they feel as though that they are certainly closing in and that they can pick up through the uh, several of the readily available pieces of machinery, they can pick up certain areas of the brain lighting up, showing increased activity, which absolute parallels at the time what the investigators believe is going on. Such as tell someone, think of something sad, and while they're in one of those scanning machines of the brain, it will consistently light up in a certain area. And they say, are you thinking of something sad? And perhaps the person's laying there and tears in their eyes and they go, yeah. And they find that that happened. They, anyway, they go on and on and there's been discussions. I'm just giving them credit that it's modern because it is a new version. It seems now to a modern person, to a modern mind reading this now, even if I pointed out that uh, you had so-called philosophers without well, technology 5,000 years ago arguing basically some of the same points and some of them even presenting what they considered to be the ultimate challenge, the ultimate difficulties in doing this. But the point is, uh, a contemporary mind, someone now would see, could not be told otherwise, that they would now see that the possibility of success must, must be increased, that there's a we just have more information, et cetera. It all makes sense. I want to point out to you for a reason, not to attack science, but scientifically, do you under, does anybody understand, I'm fixing to pull this together to how close it is to mystical activity for the last 5,000 years, for the same length of time. Uh, have I played around enough? Do any of you understand that by investigating the brain, they will never understand the mind. Now, there are some who already say that, but that is not to mean that they understand it. It is that once anything becomes part of the contemporary currency, you know that there will be factions. It will split up into two camps immediately. <coughs> They're just those that say that they doubt that the brain will ever reveal, a study of the brain will ever reveal the nature of human consciousness. They're, they call it consciousness. I was just calling it the mind. But then they add to it. They do not see it as a simple statement of reality. Then they drag in uh, all sorts of footnotes, conditions, wherewithals, which is understandable. They just say that they do not believe that the technology, that our ability to study the brain itself will ever do it, or they believe that the brain is not the sole site of human consciousness. They, they have all sorts of reasons. Uh, there is no reason, as they imagine. It is this, that the mind cannot conceive of itself. This is the very thing that mystics have been attempting to do for the same length of time. Perhaps I would have made a better point to present it another way and 
I could have started my first part about them investigating human consciousness and say that they will never investigate it the correct way. That even if they could succeed, they will never go about it in the correct way. And I'm saying that mystics have been attempting to do it, and there have been by all reports, in whom I do. We have had successes, whereas neurology has had no success and will never have a success. We had men in our field <laughs> succeeding 5,000 years ago. But those in the field of neurology, even if they got machines that will you know, scan the molecular structure of the brain, 5,000 years from now, doing that will not reveal the nature of the mind or human consciousness. Why is it that they will not, that ordinary people, I'm not picking on neurologists now or science, why is it that men will not look, ordinary men will not look in their attempt to understand the mind, will not look at the one thing that would offer some possibility. They will not look at the one thing. They will compile statistics. They will create a huge database of anecdotal case histories. They will continue, without any doubt, to develop increasingly complex technology to probe, to measure, to weigh, to gauge the electrical chemical activity of the brain. There's no doubt that will continue, which will add additional info. They'll have to have a larger and larger database. There'll be more and more papers writ for, more and more papers writ attacking their mythology attacking the way that they have analyzed these statistics, and they will be no closer. There is only one possible way that for a human, for any human, to understand the nature of the mind or the nature of human consciousness, and that would be for that person to understand it in him. That no one does save mystics. Some people skate along the edge, and not everyone who calls themselves a mystic does it. We have had philosophers, poets, all sorts of non-scientific non people throughout the ages, including those who identified themselves with religions that considered to be saints or nuns or rabbis, who were skating right up to the edge of it. But it always becomes with ordinary people, including some so-called or some self-identified mystics throughout the ages, but it always becomes a matter not unlike the situation I have just attempted to roughly describe regarding neurology, that is science's study of the brain, of the mind, human consciousness. Because when you're doing it under another guise, uh, if it was some Christian mystic, some Christian writer, some monk three or four thousand years ago, and he was writing about all the ways in, that he had been meditating for years and living alone, and he was talking about God and etc. And I could look at it and show you that you could take exactly what he was saying and take away the church, and he is attempting to take away the idea of God as being something outside the person, which you can read any anything, no matter how religious. If it has survived the ages and a lot of people like it, I could take it and use it just as it is, and just replace, just point to you that the man was calling God the mind, calling the mind God. And it doesn't matter whether he understood it, but here is the problem with just skating to the edge. If you're doing it under the guise of anything, Christian, a Sufi, a Buddhist, anything, if you're doing it under a guise, you're doing it under the auspices of a technology. You're doing it under the umbrella of something outside you, and you can never get closer than skate up to the outskirts. Kind of wander around the perimeter of the mind. Make observations of it. It's like being outside of a city, and you attempt to study the internal workings of the city by staying out there, and throughout the ages, throughout your life at least, collecting information, reading past reports. That's very important because if you're going to study this city, let's, the mind, let's call it a city. If you're going to study it today, not being sarcastic, 
This is a fact. This is, a, this is the operations of the ordinary mind. If you had decided at an early age that your calling, your desire, was to understand the nature of that city, the mind, you would spend at least the first third of your adult life in the serious study of what other people had guessed, observed about it. So from one view, you would waste the first third of your adult life by trying to read what everybody else has observed when it's right there and all you got to do is go observe. That's one thing. So you become an expert. You get a degree and you are now, let's say you have a doctorate and you are theoretically a walking compendium of all the worthwhile, the, the more salient points of all the previous knowledge regarding the city in one human. You are a doctor of observation. You're a doctor of neurology, a doctor of psychology, whatever. But you are now a learned person. That uh, Life is always as balanced out that to get a PhD and something like that. It, it takes about as many years. Nobody planned it, but it takes about as many years that the most sincere student, a man who has great interest in the study of the city, it takes about as long to get a PhD. It works out about the same length of time that the man has taken about all that shit he can absorb. <laughs> that a good, they don't analyze it that way. Nobody planned it, knows involved. But I assure you, and some of you know it, to finally get within you know, a semester or two of having, or it appears that your paper will be accepted and it so that, anyway, you can see your PhD pretty certainly on the horizon. The feeling is, it's a good thing. I mean, here I've, I've invested 10, 12 years of my life because if it took one more week than it's, <laughs> it's going to take now, I would throw up and I would go in to air conditioning <laughs> repair. <laughs> It's just one of those things. So, but there it is. And as far, but here's what you need to, or what I'm trying to get you to consider, not for an attack on education or anything, but having to do with your own attempt, having to do with the arrangement of life itself. Using this city, calling the mind allegorically a city, ordinary minds could argue to the contrary of this. And I could do it for them. But uh, this is the one single area in which the attempt at education, education's attempt, is ludicrous. It is absolutely meaningless. Even the study of the human body, you need somebody else's help, or it would be the only reasonable approach, because you would not want to, if you wanted to learn anatomy, you would certainly not want to end up opening yourself up to see what a heart looked like, to see what the internal cavity education then. That is, someone else's experience of which you can avail yourself through whatever means, through writing, through photographs, nowadays through electronic recordings. You would avail yourself of it. Or the engineering, you would want to avail yourself. You wouldn't want to start trying to build bridges and spend half your life with most of your bridges collapsing and killing people and you're being <laughs> tied up in court. You learn, you learn the principles of bridge building, you take advantage. Right. In any other field, you can find it to be worthwhile to study. That is to gain apparent information collected by others prior to you. In any other field, except one. The study of the mind. Now, at first you might say, well, it could be of importance. Well, because the libraries are full of the recorded histories of what other people said they discovered, you just first have to realize this, that they didn't discover anything. Mm. There's plenty of writings, but even those at a fairly even keel out in the ordinary world will end their great opus maximus at the final 3,000 page end of footnote they will at least end up saying, of course, I do not present this as the attempt to actually explain the human mind. This is simply your humble writer's humble attempt to add to that which I'm sure in the future will become much fuller and explanatory. Sign your humble servant, Dr. So-and-so. Or I'll put it to you another way. If people in the past, in science, in some field, psychology, neurology, if people have 
learn something of the human mind that is genuine, valid, and could be useful, even if they had, which they haven't. Even if they had, why are you going to get up and go to a school somewhere, or even go buy a book to study it, when you've got it right here? If this is what you want to study, if this is what you want to understand, even if somebody else did understand and wrote it in a book, I'll make it simpler. I was going to drag it out and say, why would you go and enroll in school and spend 30 or 40 or 130 or $40,000 nowadays to get a PhD, and it took you 12 years when you could have set it home alone? Because here it is, assuming that you actually have that much interest in it and that you're intelligent enough to get it. If you're going to be intelligent enough that a legitimate school will hand you a PhD 12 years from now, then you're smart enough that here you got it. It's not going anywhere. You got a trap study. You can study anytime you want to. Class is always open. All you got to do is sit there, stand there, lay there. And there it is. And you can study it. And so, but even if, it, if I didn't exaggerate that much, well, that's not, even if I didn't picture it to that extent, why even go buy a book? If everything that's ever been known of the human mind was in one book somewhere, why go waste 22 bucks? Why go spend a half a night reading it? It's right here. Save you 22 bucks. Plus, you've got to admit, even an ordinary person, that first-hand observation to ordinary people has got to be better than second-hand. Why go read what somebody else observed about the human mind, they say, and you ponder it and think about it, weigh it, go, mm -hmm, then have to go back and reread again the way they wrote it. Why do all that? Even if you got something out of it. Even if you did. Why, why I fool around with an unnecessary middleman? Absolutely unnecessary. When ordinary minds say that they, that is ordinary people, say that they want to study or that they want to know the nature of consciousness, no matter how sincere they are, sincerity has nothing to do with it. No matter how intelligent, no matter what their IQ is, no matter what their perseverance, their ability to study, their ability to absorb statistics and information, all of that, no matter, they will go nowhere. And you realize, out in the ordinary world, it is not, it has never even reached the point that anyone notices that. Which beyond that, I'm really, I'm not kicking a dead man after that. I'm kicking a man who was kicking a dead man a second ago. Yeah. <laughs> but they do not study the mind. They do not even try. Again, it's, sincerity has nothing to do with it. They believe they are. But they are not studying the mind. They're not even attempting to. Think about it. Nobody attempts to. You ask them, they say they do, especially if it's their field. They say, well, certainly, that's what I spend 20 hours a day. And they don't. There's only one group of people in the history of man and as I said, they are strung out in different fields. They're not strung out for you dopers. <laughs> they are strung out in different fields. As I said, they pop up, if you can see it. But anyway, it pops up in general literature, poetry, uh, drama, philosophy. Originally, the, the field of philosophy was their only place to stand around and pretend that they actually had a job or a, <laughs> some, sort, some sort of undertaking. But it's really, uh, and I say mystic because that, compared to science, it has such a, uh, dive, it has such a uh, antipodal, yeah, connotation to science is the reason I picked it out, knowing that science would normally take it, the idea of the mystical as being uh, the absolute opposite to what they're involved with, and in fact would dismiss it. That's why I went ahead and used it. But that is where it is. And also religion. As I said, there were people in religion that were doing it, have been doing it. But it's all the area of mysticism. 
in the area of mysticism has never been correctly publicly perceived, and they're not going to any more than they are the mind. But everyone that's ever been involved with the, from the Hindus on through Zoroaster, through the Buddhists, through the Jews, through the Christians, through the Jains, through the Zens, through the Sufis, through all the, uh, anybody I left out, they were all doing one thing. Many of them started out uh, believing they were doing something else. But those who actually achieved some reward from this, normally referred to as an awakening, an enlightenment, a liberation, a rejoining or a joining with the universe, with creation, all of that was a result of one thing, and that was the, uh, their attempt to directly understand their mind. Everyone who begins it never completes it. Everyone who begins it under, as I said, most people, well, let's say all people, make it easy, that everyone starts out under some other idea of what they're doing. They may start believing that they are attempting to uh, discover the nature of reality, or that they, they want to know God directly, that they want to experience, they want to be in the presence directly of Allah or of creation. It, they start off with all sorts of ideas, or that they just want to understand the nature of good and evil, that they want to understand, uh, in years past, before there was such a term as scientists, philosophers even did say that they, what they wanted to do was understand the nature of reality, physical reality. And some never get past that, whatever stage it was, of thinking it was God, and et cetera. Those who do, and it's not just a direct step, but those who finally get somewhere realize that what they have been doing, even if for years they, their belief was that they were pursuing some sort of direct understanding or experience with God, or that they were actually trying to study, they were trying to plumb the intellectual depths of what is reality out there, or what is the physical nature of reality. In other words, in sort of a scientific way, of what is stuff. What is all this stuff outside of me? All of it comes down, everything I've mentioned, everything comes down to one thing, whether they get there or not, and that is the study, the attempt to understand, to recognize, but to study at first their mind. If you ever get that far, anyone who gets that far also is faced, it's not necessarily an instant recognition either at that time, because a person will still attempt, even get the, got that far, will still for a long time attempt to study the mind with methods through means by approaches other than the only one possible, which is the mind itself. They will attempt to study the mind once someone has a fair, they believe, recognition of what they're doing, that it's coming down to the mind. I see what it is. The mind has been the challenge all along. In the mind must lie what I am looking for that would unlock the mysteries, the questions I have that would unlock my question as to what is the nature of the universe or is there a God or where did this come from? Why are we here? All of that. That they get to the point they, they believe this is the key. This is the key. And yet they will continue. That that is a mile post. But many people never get past that. Because they will continually, as ridiculous as I could make it sound, as unreasonable as I could make it sound, that even after they understand that, they're strongly suspected. They will, for a long period of time, and perhaps endlessly, still look outside the mind for the way in which to come to an understanding of the mind. We're back to me uh, pointing out that you, now we have, we're 5,000 years past Zoroaster and Vishnu and Buddha and Abraham, and we now have technology that will do things unbelievably, or it will be unbelievable to Moses or Jesus or somebody like, to a mystic, to say they can actually photograph the brain in operation. They can pinpoint where the brain hears, 
They can pinpoint where the brain is feeling sorrow. They can show you that. And I'm sure, I'm sure that if on a slow day, if Buddha didn't have anything else to do and there was nothing good on TV, <laughs> and somebody took him and showed him that, he'd think, wow, you know, that, that is funny. So that's it. Well, that's all right. <laughs> but it would not tell him anything. Nor is it going to tell them anything. These so-called awakenings, enlightenments, have been often throughout the ages in all sorts of cultures and eras been described as the direct perception of reality. The direct perception of what life is. What can be more direct than the mind looking at itself if that's where the answer is? If that is what a person is attempting to study, if that is what they're going to be ultimately, confaced, uh, ultimately confronted with, why does not someone turn their mind directly on the mind? You know, I could stop there and make it sound as though, assuming that I was insinuating that, you know, I know the answer and I got that down and ended on, as you would normally expect any sort of lecture to end on, most lectures, some sort of accusatory note <laughs> tied to the uh, tacitly implied superior knowledge of the lecturer. That why do men, if they want to study the mind, if they're finally coming around to believing that the knowledge of human consciousness may be the supreme study that the supreme discovery of man may lie in him understanding human consciousness because from that seems to flow most of what seems to be important and singular in our lives. And I say, well, if they're going to do all that, why are, out, why are they out there studying rats? Why are they out there studying sick people, abnormally wired up people, faulty brains? Why are they spending billions of dollars to photograph the brain when all they got to do with the mind is what they want to study, why don't they turn their mind on their mind and study it directly? See, it's just an ordinary lecture, and I go, huh, and I timed it to where that's the end of it, and I would look confidently like, well, I guess I, you know, I gave you something either to think about, or I made you feel bad <laughs> if you listen to it. Did I, did I point out, huh, why is that? Why is that, huh? Hmm. The why is that is the nature of the enlightenment. What? 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 <laughs> My last comment on the matter for the night is that one of the major attractions at world famous Coney Island is reputed to have been secretly owned and operated by a band of mystics. No!